Hallelujah. That was good. Come on. You know, you know what? I remember, I remember about five, six years ago when Hannah first started playing the guitar watching YouTube. You know what I mean? So she would come in and be like, check this out. It'd be like, ding, ding, ding. You know what I mean? But it was still like a thousand times better that I could do. But I was like, I just felt like something on it. You know what I mean? And I prophesied over her there, then that her music would go across this nation and around the world. Come here, Hannah. And so let me get... So I believe that. I believe Freedom City Worship is going to one day be sang in every church. Come on. Uh, uh, just like Hillsong, just like whatever. You know what I mean? Because we got a unique sound that is coming down. So just stretch your hands towards Hannah right now. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for Hannah, God, and God, Lord, I see all the hours and all the, the, the time and the stress, God, that goes into leading worship and developing, God, Lord, an album, God, Lord, so we just pray that you give her strength, God, and wisdom, and, and for Janelle and Stephen and CJ, God, and Sean, God, and the entire team, God, that you would just breathe, God, Lord, on this album, we pray an anointing, God, upon this EP, God, Lord, that it would go out, God, and touch lives not only here locally, God, Lord, but around the world, in Jesus' mighty name, we declare, we declare today, Father, that you would raise up Freedom City Worship, God, Lord, to be a sound, God, Lord, that goes throughout this world, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Come on. She don't even look five months pregnant, does she? <laughs> Praise God. We want to, let me have the ushers come forward real quick. We, uh, so we, we believe in tithing here. We be giving, be believe in giving the first 10% of what God brings into our house, into the local church. And then above and beyond that, we want to give tithes and offerings to things like the EP, Art Reach, Hope Home Helpers, and the different things that we have. You know what I mean? But I would just ask you to mark clearly on your envelope, you know, what you're giving to. I know I was going to give a certain amount to the EP and I'm going to double it. Come on, because that was a good one. So just go ahead and stand up. Raise your offering to the Lord. I want to pray over it. And so uh, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just bring our off tithes and our offerings to you, God. Lord, we bring the first of what comes into our house to you to honor you, God, because we're so grateful, Lord, for what you've done for us in Jesus' name. And you may come forward and give your offering uh, today. I remember this song. It's an old Amy Grant song, isn't it? Y'all don't know nothing about Amy Grant. I want to talk real briefly about the we have the three one challenge so this is something we started when we first started our church and dave manning talked about it on friday a little bit but we want everyone to pick those flyer connect flyers invite cards at the um at the connection table we want everybody to pick up flyers for the for the entire week and to hand them out and so the three one challenge is this hand three people invite cards and offer to pray for one person so you don't even, it could be like, you know, at your office, just go put it on someone's cubicle. Be like, there you go. You know what I mean? You don't even have to talk to them. But I, I, I challenge you to give away three, but then also to offer to pray for one person every day. And let the Lord pray. That morning in prayer, be like, God, lead me to the right people to give this card to. Lord, lead me to the person to pray for. You know what I mean? Instead of, you know, cussing out the lady that has an attitude, you know what I mean? At the come and go, say, you know what? Here's an invite card. Hey, could I pray for you? Because here's the thing. You don't know what they're going through. They might have just lost somebody. They might be struggling with addiction. You know what I mean? And so we're to be the light. So don't react like, oh, don't talk to me like that. You know what I mean? Don't be rude to me. Instead, you know, give them an invite card. And once you give them the invite card, then you like got to, you got to like put some act right on. Because now you're representing the church. You know what I mean? And so, uh, so, so I've... I'm not even going to say it. So there's been times when I'm like, 
I don't even want to say I'm a pastor right now because I feel so stupid for how I've acted. But anyway, so we want to encourage you to do that. And so next Sunday, what we're going to do, uh, go ahead and just scratch that from the, the DVD, what I just said. But anyway, so the... <laughs> So what I want you to do is uh, 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 um, um, pick up the invite cards, hand them out. You know, everyone invite around 20 people to church. You know, everybody. So next Sunday is going to be Bring a Friend Sunday. You know what I mean? So you can even tell them, like, it's Bring a Friend Sunday, and I'm going to win, like, you know what I mean, some cool Freedom City gear. You know what I mean? If I bring. And so just pack out a whole row of people. You know what I mean? Bring people in, and we're going to do a, a, a hardcore evangelistic message. Come on, on, on the prodigal son uh, next week. So here's what I believe. We're going to be praying. I want our team to be praying and to be fasting. I believe that people that you invite that are hardened, that they don't want to hear anything about God, I believe that if you bring them into church next Sunday, God is going to wreck their life. Come on. Come on. And so, uh, how many commit to, to doing the 3-1 challenge? Just raise your hand. You know what I mean? Don't make me start calling people out today and raising their hand. All right. It's all right, I can't see without my glasses on anyway, you're good. So, but we started a series on generous giving a few weeks ago. Pastor David Evans spoke two weeks ago. I spoke last week. And uh, so uh, we're going to be talking about giving today. And the title of the message is, It's a Heart Issue. Tap your neighbor and say, It's a Heart Issue. And so if you would stand with me real quick, I want to read Matthew 6.21. Uh, Matthew 6.21. And it goes like this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's say that together. Let's say, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just pray, God, that you would have your way this morning. God, Lord, we pray, God, that you would move on our hearts, God, and make us into the givers, the generous givers, God, that you've called us to be, God, not only in our money, but in our time, in our talents, God, that we would be a generous people right here on the north side of Springfield. God, Lord, we pray your anointing upon this service. God, Lord, we pray the shackles be broken today in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, yes. tap your neighbor and say, you look good. And you may be seated in the presence of God. So after this short series, next week we'll do the prodigal son. The following week we're going to we'll get right back into our Luke series. How many are excited to get back into Luke? We were there last year. We're getting back into it today. That's one of our core values is Bible teaching. We believe that teaching the Bible is the primary catalyst for life change. Huh? The Word of God will transform your life. I encourage everybody to get into your Word. You know what I mean? Every morning, get into, open your Bible and begin to get in to your word. And so, like I said, we're going to talk about money, and, and we did this last week, so go ahead and tap your neighbor and tell them, all they, I knew it, all the church wants is my money. <laughs> tap them again and said, you were thinking it, you might as well say it. <laughs> now that we got that out of the way, we can get to, get to some talk here about, about giving and you know, you know what, uh, uh, at pa at, for, pa for it's, it's like for, for a lot of pastors, talking about tithes and offerings is hard to do. You know what I mean? Because then you're going to get people saying crazy stuff like, oh, that's all they want is our money. And you know what I mean? And so, uh, but you know what, man? I, I just, I honestly, you know, I don't care anymore. I'm going to preach the word of God. You know what I mean? And if it's offensive, that's okay. You know what I mean? I, don't, I, I do what I do primarily for an audience of one. You know what I mean? And, and so uh, uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but it, I believe it's good. And so, but, um, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, and I just want to say, and I said this last week, but I just want to say it again, that me and my wife give way more than 10% of our, of our income that comes into our house um, to this church, and we're sold out. We believe in it. <coughs> so you know what? It's easy to fake it until you have to put, your money in it. Come on, somebody. Come on. Nobody is a born giver. We're all born takers. We enter this world with a fallen nature, which at the very root is selfish. You know what I mean? So, uh, but giving and tithing should not be a burden. You know what I mean? It should be a joy. That's what I want to kind of instill in us today. And I want us to be a people that we take great joy in giving to God because we're so grateful for what he done for us. Come on. 
How many were here for last week's message? Come on, remember we talked about giving the first fruits, giving the first 10% of what God comes into, what comes into your house. So that means, like before you, uh, you know what I mean, get your cigarettes. Come on, some of y'all need to stop smoking anyway. But uh, before you put into your 401k, you know what I mean, before you pay your mortgage, huh? But, and we said before you pay your, your Harley payment. And then I like looked over at Jason because he just got a Harley on. But, but you know what I mean, so we want to put God first and trust him to handle the rest. We give our first 10% to God, and God will bless the, the 90%. It all belongs to God anyway. Uh, so, There are more than 500 verses in the Bible concerning prayer, nearly 500 verses on faith, but over 2,000 verses that talk about money and the stewardship, stewardship thereof. 16 uh, uh, of the 38 parables of Jesus were about money. So, Jesus, uh, uh, so money is a test for God. How we handle money uh, uh, reveals volumes, you know what I mean, about our priorities, our loyalties, and our affections, because where our heart is, there our treasure will be also. Uh, so it's a test from God, because your heart will always follow your treasure. So if you're sold out for the Lord, your treasure will go to the house of the Lord. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 so we don't teach give to get here. We teach give to give. Come on. Out of a generous heart and out of a grateful heart, not as greed as a motive. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the remainder of the service. Uh, uh, but we understand that the principle of seed time and harvest is universal. So that's true. Well, you know what I mean? You reap what you sow. You get back what you put in. Come on. Some of us know that in our marriages. What you give is what you get back. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, 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 so but, 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 but well, we just want to give the, the first uh, of what comes into our house to God. We talked about first fruits. I'm not going to hit on that again. We talked about how honor the Lord with your possessions so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And of course, the, the, the live, in, the, in the Bible days, it was livestock. It was, uh, 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 you know, it was the crops that were given, you know what I mean, to the Lord when they came in. You know what I mean? But today, it could be like you work for steadfast construction. Come on. You work for Rusty, you know what I mean, or, uh, or you're a... You're a you're you're a drug and alcohol counselor, you know what I mean, or you know what I mean, you, whatever, or you're the harder, harder house manager, come on somebody, so we got the harder house manager in the house today, got herself a new job, but uh, you know, or whatever, whatever it is that you do, you know what I mean, if you, you run Messina's Plumbing, come on, we got a couple plumber, plumbers in the house. Tim and, 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 and Joe Messina, and they give faithfully. I mean, they give above and beyond. But so whatever you do, that's what comes into your house. You know what I mean? So you don't have to go give, you know what I mean, the firstborn lamb. How many have a firstborn lamb at their house? Nobody. Okay. Actually, I thought someone would raise their hand, but anyway. Sometimes you get people that aren't paying attention, and then they, they raise their hand. I guess everybody was paying attention. Start talking about money, everybody starts listening. <laughs> Matthew 7, 1 through 2, watch this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, and it says this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged with the same measure you use. That will be measured back to you. So, is the word money in these verses? The context is judging. It's not money, but the context is judging. So don't judge or you will be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged. And the measure that you use to judge someone else, that will be used to come back to you. Now watch this. Let's, let's remember that and let's move over to Luke chapter 6, verse 7 and 38, uh, 37 and 38. And it reads like this. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Given, it will be given to you good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will men give into your bosom for the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So this is the parallel passage from the Gospel of Matthew. And in the first and the last, it says, judge not, and you won't be judged. And then it says, uh, 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 you know, with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So it says, judge not, you won't be judged. Condemn, me, condemn not, you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And watch the verse in the mid middle, you know what I mean, which says give, right? And it will be given back 
to you good measure running over will men pour into your bosom. So the word money does not appear in these verses and yet most of the time when we use this verse we, we talk about money. You know what I mean? So we're like, giving it will be given back to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. What they're talking about is judgment. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but anyway, but we continue to use that verse because it has a universal application because of the law of the seed time and harvest. That, that's, a real, that's a real thing. So, uh, 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 but, but God, uh, giving is about money, but it's about a lot more. It's about our heart. And so giving applies to every area of our life, not just... Uh, money. It's about the heart. Because Jesus said, where your treasure is. Some people say the church is after my money. And I would say, yes, God, not the church, is after your money. Because He is after your heart. Your heart is connected to your wallet, I guarantee it. If your heart is not for God and His kingdom, you will be offended every time someone takes up an offering. Every time we talk about the Freedom City EP. Every time we talk about the Hope Homes. Every time someone at the gas station says, you want to give a dollar, you know what I mean, to poor children in Africa, you're going to get offended. You know what I mean? If your heart is not in the kingdom. You know what I mean? So uh, the context of this passage is the heart. Don't judge, don't condemn forgive, give, right? And so uh, the give he's talking about is judgment, like I said, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 but, but the merciful will receive mercy. We want to be merciful people. You know, as leaders, sometimes in this church, we have to deal with, with issues, you know what I mean, and, and discipline and church discipline and with the Hope Homes and with, you know, the church because we're a community. And so we're a community. So what you do, you're not an island to yourself. So what you do affects other people. When you're gossiping, when you're in immorality, when you go out and get drunk and threaten people, you know what I mean? That affects the community. So we have to address issues in this community, and we're not, we're not ashamed to do that. But at the same time, you've got to understand what our heart motive is. Our heart motive is that people will be restored, that people would live for Jesus. Man, we, that's the whole reason we do this thing, you know what I mean? So, so lives will be transformed. And there's people in the audience here today that have responded, you know what I mean, to church discipline discipline and grown through it and their lives have been transformed for the better but we want to be merciful yet in love bring correction right and so that's the context it's judging condemning and forgiving but you can apply it to other areas as I said because of the law of sowing and reaping whatever you give you will get back if you're always yelling and having a bad attitude it's going to be amazed because you're going to be like why is everybody always yelling at me and having a bad attitude well, <laughs> I have no idea. So how do we develop a heart of generosity? Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 15.7. Um, this is talking, uh, this is a passage in Deuteronomy. It talks about giving to the poor. But it says this, if there is a poor man, Deuteronomy 15.7, I'll go ahead and read it. If there, is a poor, if there is among you a poor man of your brethren with any of the gates in your land, which the Lord God is giving you, right there we see giving, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but shall open wide to him willingly, that's a heart issue, and lend to him sufficient for whatever he needs. So in the brief moments that we have left today, I'm just going to talk about four points you know what I mean? Uh, 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 to become generous, generous givers. And I want to suggest uh, uh, the book, The Blessed Life by, Blessed Life by Robert Morris. Um, so if you guys have not read, how many have read that book? Has anybody read that book? I encourage you to read it. You know what I mean? If you haven't read it, you know, pick up that book. And, and much of what I'm saying comes directly uh, from the book. It's just for his, for, that's his life message. And it's phenomenal teaching on giving to God. And so Deuteronomy 15.9 says, uh, so the number one, the point number one is deal with a selfish heart. And so Deuteronomy 15.9 says, beware lest there be a wicked thought in your heart. So do we have Deuteronomy 15.9? So Deuteronomy 15.9 says, beware uh, lest there be a, a wicked thought in your heart, saying, On the seventh year, your release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your brother, your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. Notice in this passage, selfishness is wickedness in God's eyes, and it becomes sin. 
This is what he's saying. When your brother comes to you and asks for some money because all his crops had, had been destroyed that, that year and he comes and asks you for some money and you tell him no because you're like, in six months is the year of Jubilee and all this stuff's going to be forgiven. So if he don't pay me back in six months, I'm not getting that money back. God says, go ahead and lend it to him anyway. So the context of that is God instituted an economic system where every seven years... All your debt was forgiven. Come on. How many could go for that? Huh? Your home, come on, your car payment, your home loan, come on. Those credit cards you should have never got so deep into anyway. You know what I mean? All your debts are forgiven every seven years. And so that would be really, really cool if we could do that again. But uh, uh, so what he's saying is you see your brother that he comes in and, and wants to give money, but it's only six months till God, everything's going to be forgiven. You know what I mean? And you decide not to give because of that. God says that's selfishness and, and, and wickedness, right? So why did God create giving? It's throughout his word. It's undeniable that giving is throughout the God's word. You know what I mean? So why did God create giving, do you think? Huh? So some people would say, uh, 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 some people would say, uh, 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 you, you know, the, the, here's the thing. Jesus was amazed, right, that, the, that the, widow, the little widow woman that gave two pennies, right? But if a wealthy man gave two pennies, that would be more of an insult. Come on, somebody, right? You know what I mean? It, 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 now you're just tipping God or not even a tip. You know what I mean? And so, uh, 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 so God was impressed, you know what I mean, with someone who gave. Jesus was. You know what I mean? So why did God create giving? Some people say that God created giving, you know what I mean, to support his work in the kingdom, but here's the thing. Do you really think that God needs your money to support his work? Honestly. Is, is the light bill in heaven not getting paid? Come on. Are they running out of gold for the streets of gold in heaven? You know what I mean? And so there's this illustration about this guy that, you know, he, 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 stuck, he snuck a bag of gold into heaven. You know what I mean? Was going to get him one of the nicer mansions. You know what I mean? Stuck, snuck himself in with, the, with a suitcase full of gold bars, right? And then he got in there and he's like, hey, St. Peter check it out. You know what I mean? And Peter's like, you brought asphalt? You know what I mean? Because in heaven, streets of gold, it's asphalt. When I, was, when I was preparing that, it came out a lot funnier. When I, you ever do that? It was really funny when I did this. I was laughing myself. Evidently, it might have been the delivery. I don't know. But anyway, rough crowd here this morning talking about tithes and offerings. Everybody got crazy on me. All right. Uh, God doesn't need your money. You need to be a giver to God. Come on. God, God did not create giving for his sake. He created it for your sake because giving more than anything else works out selfishness and greed out of our hearts. Many people say, preach, give to God so you'll get something back. And so people think, because I give to God, I'm going to get something back. You know what I mean? Instead of working out selfishness and working greed out of your lives, greed becomes a motive to give to God. So some people give to get. And do you think God is up in heaven going, oh, this is great. My people are catching the, re the vision for getting. You think that's what God's saying? No, we want to catch the revelation of giving, not getting. And so when we give, it will drive selfishness from our lives. Number two. So number one, deal with a selfish heart. Number two, deal with a grieving heart. Watch this, Deuteronomy 15.10. You shall surely give to him. Uh, your, uh, 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 you shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Grieved. That have, uh, grieved. Uh, because of the thing that the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. So, uh, 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 if you learn to give with the right heart, this passage says God will bless the work of your hand in everything that you do. So, it's a heart issue. Selfishness attacks you before you give, and then grief attacks you after right? So at first you're like, oh man, I can't afford this. I can't afford to give 10%. I can't afford to give an offering. I can't afford to even give 5%. You know what I mean? So selfishness attacks you before. And then if you have like a breakthrough, you know what I mean? And you give a big offering and then something breaks down. Come on, the car breaks down. Come on, the AC unit breaks down. And then you begin to say, dang it, 
the devil begins to tell you, see, you shouldn't have given, to, you given that offering. You know what I mean? And so you begin, you begin, you begin to grieve. And, 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 and so, you know, I, I, it's interesting. You know, I, I had a thought pass through my mind just now, and normally I just cast down those thoughts, right? And, uh, uh, but I was thinking, I was like, I wish I could go out to eat after church, but I don't think I have any cash on me. I don't have any cash on me to go out to eat, you know what I mean, after church. So, uh, oh, oh, come on. David Manning, thank you. A crisp $50 bill. I'm going to start saying, I'm going to start saying my, uh, 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 expressing my thoughts more often. Come on, somebody. So why when I said I did not have cash and did Dave come up and give me a crisp $50 bill? Why? No, no, hold on. <laughs> Why did he do that? Because I gave it to him before service. Come on, somebody. So Dave is not grieving. Watch this. Catch this. Dave is not grieving that he gave me a $50 bill. Why? It was mine already. Come on, somebody. He's not grieving because what he gave was mine anyway. You guys catching this? So when we grieve about giving to God, it's because we thought that was ours anyway. Come on. It's not yours. It all belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's. Come on. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Come on. So there's no reason to grieve or to be sad about giving to God what is His anyway. You know what I mean? So... Uh, and I got my own $50 bill, but maybe I, but anyway, so, but watch this. Number three, watch this. Develop a generous heart. Number three, Deuteronomy 15, 11. Watch this. Deuteronomy 15, 11. For the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you saying, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to the poor and your need, the needy in your land. So give generously. God wants us to be generous givers. We were born selfish, but we were born again generous. We need to renew our minds and get a kingdom mentality. We want to give to, uh, even if you look in Luke chapter 6, the passage that we talked about at first, but where we started today, if you go back a little bit more to about Luke chapter uh, uh, 630, it says give to others without expecting to get back. Right? It says, love your enemies. It says, bless those that curse you. It says, do to others that you would have them do to you. The whole context is the Lord dealing with the heart. It's the first thing we have to do with our children. We have to teach them how to what? Share. Children are selfish automatically. You don't have to teach them to be selfish. Everything, everything with Brookie is mine. Mine, you know what I mean. This morning, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting ready, and uh, uh, she loves to play on the phone. So, it's, you know, she probably gets that from her mom. But it, it, just kidding, <laughs> or maybe dad, maybe daddy. But uh, uh, so, but she came on, and she was like, she was like, daddy, daddy, and came, on, and I was like, hey, baby, and got down. She gave me a big old hug, and she's all phone phone and she's and I'm like no you little manipulator you know what I mean I thought he was loving me and then so like on the Christmas on the for Christmas we had the the hope homes and some people from church over for for dinner at the house we had like 30 people there you know what I mean and so this was like the first time I think Brooklyn Brooklyn really had that many people in the house I mean so she was like oh my god people were on my turf you know what I mean? She was like, she was like going over and like grabbing all her stuff. Like, mine, mine, not even using it. Mine, mine. You know what I mean? Going into her bedroom. Mine. Everybody stay out of my room. You know what I mean? Because it was all hers. And so uh, we're trying to teach Brooklyn how to be more generous. You know, uh, 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 also Brooklyn can be a little bit rough. Like, she'll come up and she'll like, am I right, Janelle? Janelle shaking her hand, yeah. Sometimes she'll just come up and just like, smack. You know what I mean? And then just like giggle all cute. It's like, what? You know what I mean? I, maybe she learned that from her mama too. Come on, something. no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. 
We don't hit each other at all in our house. We don't do that. But, uh, uh, but so you know what I mean? So we have to like teach her, you know what I mean? Gentle only. Hannah's got it, you know. So gentle only. And then Hannah will be, you know, touch dad nice, gentle. And then so she'll do it. And now she knows if she gets a little rough and we're like gentle only, you know what I mean? She'll just start like real gently, you know what I mean? So, so we're, te- we're teaching her to uh, be gentle and to not smack mama and daddy in the face. Come on. And <laughs> And to, and to be a, a generous. And uh, uh, so uh, we're trying to teach this to our, our child. And uh, of course, we have one on the way, but uh, uh, come on, somebody. So, you know what God is saying to his children? He's saying, When are you going to grow up? Amen. Come on, somebody. Got quiet in this Presbyterian church. When will we become like our Father who loved so much that He gave? We say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And then we give out of a generous heart. You know what I mean? Number four, the final point, develop a grateful heart. Deuteronomy 15, 15. This will be the last passage here that we look at. You shall remember, everybody say remember, remember. that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you there I command you this thing today. The Lord closes that thing out about being generous and says, remember that you were a slave in Egypt. God is commanding uh, us to be generous, reminding us to remember where we came from, not to forget where we came from. See, I remember I was a slave to sin. I remember I was a heroin addict. I was hopelessly uh, 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 addicted and lost in the world. There was a time when I was 19 or in, in, in my early 20s when we were making $1,000 a day selling drugs, and at the end of it, I had absolutely nothing. For the next five to seven years, I was a hopeless junkie. I gave up everything I had to my God, heroin, and I gave it through his ministers. Come on, the dope man. Come on. And so, uh, I, 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 you know, I, 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 gave, I not only, gave, I only got, gave everything that I had and everything that I stole, but when I, when I ran out, I would hawk all my stuff. And when I ran out of my stuff to hawk, I would break into your houses and take your stuff and go hawk your stuff too. You know what I mean? So you guys should be grateful that I'm saved in Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> I would take anything. Come on, but, you know. I would kick in doors at 6 o'clock in the morning and take out uh, expensive computers and back when computers were worth a lot of money, the hard drives and everything, take the computers and $30,000 printers and go hawk them just to not kick heroin um, the rest of the day. And, uh, you know, I was all in. You know, we got a friend of mine, Cisco, coming. He's now a Church of God pastor. He'll be here next month. But, uh, uh, see, you guys see me smelling good, my wife dressing me well. You know what I mean? And so it's probably hard for you to uh, maybe imagine, you know what I mean, what, what I came out of. But Cisco's probably going to come and tell some good stories so, uh, and embarrass me. But anyway, uh, 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 that's my only friend that's in the ministry. Most of my friends are dead. Um, but... I was all in for drugs, crime, and street respect, and, uh, but I also remember when I was in solitary confinement, strung out on heroin, you know what I mean, in last place at any place at all, and the Lord Jesus walked into my, walked into my prison cell, and he met me, and he transformed my life. You know, I remember when I got here to Springfield about nine years ago. Uh, and after spending the, the previous four years in prison and then a, a year in, on parole, and then uh, 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 me and Hannah were dating, you know, my second summer uh, here, and uh, uh, Hannah might remember this, but uh, a good friend of mine by the name of Johnny Tapia overdosed. Um, so Johnny Tapia was a professional boxer, um, and he was from 1998 to 2011. He was a five-time world champion boxer from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He held the unified IBF and the WBO super flyweight titles from 1994 to 1998. How many, how many are boxing fans that remember Johnny Tapia? Okay, so some of you do. And so, uh, uh, see, he grew up, uh, he was a fighter all his life. He was one of the most loyal friends I've ever had. But you know what? He was a fighter. And so when, when something went down, he would have your back 110%. And he had the uh, heart of gold, this guy. You know what I mean? But watch, he grew up on the streets on the poor side of Albuquerque, New Mexico. You know what I mean? Johnny Tapia's father had been murdered when his mother was pregnant with him. 
When he was eight years old, his mother, Virginia, was kidnapped, raped, hanged, repeatedly stabbed, left for dead by her assailant. Tapia was awakened by her screams and saw her being dragged out and tied to a truck. And he tried to tell people in the house, but they did not believe him. She was found days later, and four days later, she, she died. And never, she never regained consciousness. Four days later, she died. He was raised by his grandmother. Tapia turned to boxing at the age of nine. And uh, he's been fighting his whole life. His whole life was a fight. And he finally lost, uh, 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 he lost his battle with his greatest opponent, heroin. And, uh, and, and his wife is helping that his memories live on. But when I heard that, uh, you know, when, when I found out I was broken. Man, I, I was uh, 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 broken. Hannah was, uh, Hannah was with me during that season when that happened. You know, the other two guys I was hanging out with before I went to prison that time were uh, Mikey, who was my best friend since I was, uh, you know, we were running partners from way back. You know what I mean? And, and when I was in prison, before I came to Springfield, you know, my, when I first got to prison, I got, a, got someone sent me a kite. You know what I mean? He said, hey, Mikey's dead. You know what I mean? And what happened was we used to get into to hot bathtubs and uh, to get our veins up because our veins were so shot from, from, receiving, uh, 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 from receiving. There's Johnny Tapia right there. So... So he, Mikey got in the bathtub to get his veins up to shoot up heroin that morning. He did a big blast of heroin, and he sunk under the water, and he drowned, never, never, uh, never woke up. He just died right there. And um, the other friend that I was hanging out with, Willie, um, it happened right after Mikey, but uh, uh, right after uh, uh, Willie broke into a cartel storehouse at gunpoint and robbed him, and as he was running out of the, out of the house and hopping in his uh, girlfriend's car, jumped through the window, and the people in the house came out bucking, bop, bop, bop. And they caught him, went through the car, went through the side of the car, hit him in the side. He got up to the, uh, she, his girlfriend got up to the stoplight, and there was a cop there, and she said, I think my boyfriend, she got out of the car, said, I think my boyfriend's dying. He died on his way to the hospital. I've lost 16 other friends to overdoses and shootings, yet I'm here today. Their deaths drive me to reach people for Jesus. There are reasons why I'm so passionate about spreading the gospel. There are reasons why I'm a giver. There are reasons why me and my wife give our lives to do what we do. You know what I mean? I actually believe in what I'm doing. Come on. This is not a profession. This is a calling and it is a mandate from God. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And so thank you, God, for redeeming my life of addiction for many years. And this is what makes it easy to give when we remember where we came from. Tap your neighbor and say, don't forget where you came from. You know, I got a lot to be grateful for. I'm clean and sober, got educated, have a beautiful wife, daughter. Another son on the way, come on. Hopefully, hopefully, we're praying, we're praying, you know. Maybe I could just speak it into existence, but, uh, but if it's a girl, I'll be happy too. So, Brookie, I mean, it might be better. Another Brookie? I can't get much better than that. And so, uh, uh, I got a lot to be, be thankful for. I'm sober, educated, my kids. Uh, I get to live the God-given dream that God has given me the, the, the dream to reach people for his honor and glory, to have recovery homes, to see an army raised up of outcasts out of the prisons and the jails of the United States of America that will go across this land and preach the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ that I know I'm going to be a part of one of the greatest, the greatest move of God in history. I got a lot to be grateful for. You know, we didn't have anything when we came to Jesus. And let me tell you something, even if you had a bunch of stuff and a home and, and money in the bank, you had nothing either apart from Jesus. Come on. See, I was broken, busted, and disgusted when Jesus found me. Uh, some people talk about how much they've given up to go after Jesus. And let me tell you something. I gave up a lot to follow Jesus. I gave up suicidal thoughts. I gave up a heroin addiction. 
I gave up incarceration. I gave up hope, hopelessness. I gave up a life with no purpose and no peace. Huh? I, gave, I gave up being a horrible absentee father to my first daughter. Come on. I, I gave up being a son who hurt my parents and everybody who dared to love me. So yeah, I, I gave up a lot. I gave up a lot of pain and a lot of junk to follow Jesus so you don't have to beg me to give nothing. I'll give it all. Come on, as the worship team comes up. As the worship team comes up, God, is, God is, uh, 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 helps us deal with a selfish heart, right? The first point. And he helps us deal with a grieving heart. It's all his anyway. So stop tripping. Tap your neighbor and say, stop tripping. It's God's anyway. <laughs> Gi giving helps us become generous people. If God can get a hold of your pocketbook, he can get a hold of the rest of your life. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So how many will commit to becoming more generous in 2019? Come on. How many? Come on. Some of you guys give occasionally. You know what I mean? Some of you guys give often. Some give 10%. Some give extravagantly above and beyond the 10%. But no matter where you're at today, we want to thank you for giving to this ministry. And also, I believe that God wants to take us a little step farther. Some of, some of the people that don't give, God's going to make you into an occasional giver. The occasional givers, God's going to raise you up. You're going to be a 10% giver. You know what I mean? And the 10 percenters, God's going to push you to give 20%. Come on, or 40%. Come on. I, t I like to track everything that I give to the Lord. You know what I mean? I always have, always uh, making sure, Christina, we got it all tracked, and I write it down. You know why? Because I want to make sure I'm giving to God. At the end of the year, I want to look at my, at my stuff and be like, did I give this year? Have I given faithfully to God at, at the local church? I don't want to be a pastor that talks about it, but doesn't do it. Come on. You know what? For years, I've heard tithers say God is faithful. And you know what I've heard non-tithers say? I can't afford to tithe. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? The people that don't tithe can't say they can't afford to tithe. The people that do tithe, their testimony is that God is good and faithful. Come on. So we want to be, we want to be faithful to God. God is good. And all the time. Before we end this service... We want to give you an opportunity to respond to the grace of God. And I don't know how you came into this house, you know, but maybe you came into this house at one time you were living for Jesus, you know, but now you're not. Or you're in this house today, you've never had an encounter with Jesus. Maybe when you were worshiping, you began to feel the presence of God today in this house like you never have before. We've had people come up to us after service. I remember a few months ago, this lady came forward. She was crying. And, and then she, she, said, uh, uh, my, she said, my daughter was at church. She's 14 years old. And she looked over at me during service. And she said, oh, this is what God feels like. And then that little girl came out and she was still weeping from the service in a 14-year-old language. She said, this is what God feels like. She felt the presence of God. She gave her life to Jesus that day. Come on. And see, I know what it's like, friend. I know what it's like to be addicted, to be broken, busted, and disgusted. But I also know what it's like, you know what I mean, to have a radical encounter with Jesus. It, it, you know, uh, in 1998, on the run for attempted murder, I left Albuquerque on my way to Mexico. And I went through Phoenix. I went to Phoenix, Arizona. And I bumped into this little recovery home by the name of Victory Outreach, like our men's home. And I had heard that people had gotten clean. I had heard that people stayed out of prison through these recovery homes. So I went in there just to get off the drugs, not to meet Jesus. I just went there to get off the drugs so I could not be riding dirty so I could make it across the border and continue to do what I was doing. But I went into that little recovery home and man, I had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ. My life was changed. I was turned, it was turned upside down and right side up. You know what I mean? I graduated the program. I ran the program. I went to the school ministry in downtown Los Angeles. And then they asked me to, to be a missionary to the Philippines. And, and God said, go. And so I went to the Philippines and God moved for two and a half years. We planted churches. We started recovery homes. Two and a half years I came back to LA and I was arrested at LAX 
on that old attempted murder charge. And now here I am. I didn't even make it to the streets, just to the paddy wagon, back up in L.A. County Jail. You know what I mean? And, and I'm facing 20, 25 years in prison for absconding, for attempted murder, for habitual criminal charges, and some more stuff. And then what happened was uh, uh, I went to Albuquerque, and they, extra, they extradited me six months later to fight the charges. And I got released from, from jail, Bernalillo County Detention Center, to be able to go out and to fight the charges. And so while I was fighting the charges, I relapsed. I became discouraged. I stopped going to church. I stopped praying. I stopped being connected with the community of faith. And I ended up relapsing and going back to drugs like a dog returning to its vomit. And you know what I remember? And then I just went on the run. I figured if they want to get me, they're going to have to catch me. You know what I mean? And I was living at a little cheap hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico on Central Avenue called the De Anza. I know I got one friend of mine from, from, from Albuquerque here the De Anza Hotel now they tore it down because that place was a hot mess but anyway uh, I was right there in that little hotel and I would sell drugs in the alley and I would shoot shoot up drugs all day long you know all night long and I remember I remember many times I would sit on the edge of, edge of that bed and you know what there were demons running around me with voices of little children I saw shadow creatures how many have seen a shadow creature before I saw shadow creatures coming through the room you know what I mean I would leave my body at, at, when I was sleeping I would leave my body which now I know they say is astral projecting I would leave my body and be attacked in the air by demons you know what I mean and, and the enemy really began to attack me and he began to tell me your life's a waste you know what I mean? You don't even know your daughter. You hurt everybody who loves me. You're a hopeless junkie. You're going to prison for the rest of your life. Why don't you just kill yourself? And so I would take that 45 Ruger that I kept under the mattress and I would put it to my forehead and I would want to blow my head off. Now, if you know my background, my background is where I come from. It's not cool to kill yourself. You know, nowadays that might but it's, I, so that means I had hit the low of the low. You know what I mean? And I stuck that, I stuck that pistol to my head and, and I wanted to blow my head off. You know what? But by the grace of God, I didn't pull that trigger. I was picked up six months later. I was sent to prison. By the grace of God, I only got eight years in prison. You know what I mean? When I got to prison, I was doing the same thing. You know what I mean? But then uh, I got busted for suspicion of bringing narcotics into the facility. And I was put in level five of Santa Fe, New Mexico, P&M. A, a, a prison in solitary confinement and right there I got down on my knees and I said Jesus if you're still there would you come back into my life and let me tell you something friend come on it was like waves of electric liquid I said it was like waves of electric liquid they flowed over me for five months. My prison became a palace. Man, my dungeon was filled with light. I, was, I, I did nothing but read my Bible. That whole five months I was in prison. God restored the call that He had upon my life. And, and then I was released back to the general population. I voted in as inmate pastor. God began to move in the inmate church. And, God, and I began to do global university undergraduate courses from the state pen in New Mexico. I got out, did my parole came up to Central Bible College nine years ago, graduated with a bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, met my beautiful wife there. The way she says it is she took one look at me and fell madly in love, but, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, kinda, is that right, babe? Yeah. And so, uh, but, uh, she just said, yeah, it'd be nice. But, uh, 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 and so we got out of, got out of, uh, uh, I graduated Bible school and then uh, I graduated seminary and God called us to stay and plant this church. You know what I mean? And so uh, that's, what, that's, that's, that's what God has done in my life. So I don't, you're in this house today and I don't know, you know what I mean, where you come from. I don't know your background. But I believe that right now, I believe the Spirit of God is moving upon hearts. Right now, Lord, we pray a wall of fire around this sanctuary. Holy Spirit, you begin to move on hearts right now. I pray the fire of God begin to fall upon hearts right now. Right now, your heart is beginning to burn. And that's a sign that God is calling you back to Him. This is what I want to do. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, if you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to get right with God today. 
today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, you were living for Jesus at one time, but now you're not. Two, you've never had a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ, but you say, I want Him today. Three, from all over this place, you say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Go ahead and raise your hand if that's you. I see a three right here. Three hands right there. Anyone else? Four, five. Anyone else? Six, back in the back. Anyone else? You say, Pastor, I want to get right with God today.